Hello everybody, Scoop It Up here. And today I'm going to be doing a video um, kind of showing everybody how redstone computers work. Now, I remember back probably about a year and a half, two years ago, when I saw my first redstone computer. And I had absolutely no clue how any of it worked. So I plan on changing that and kind of educating you guys on how exactly a basic redstone computer works. So I'm going to be covering uh, how single core uh, computers work, um, but dual core and anything like that is quite similar. Uh, so just pay attention and uh, you should by the end of this have a general understanding of, of how exactly these things work. So I'm going to be using uh, these kind of diagrams uh, and I'll be explaining how how these diagrams work but basically rather than using redstone um, I'm just kind of using uh, wool to signify what the different parts are and these repeaters uh, show what direction information or anything on these these wires or whatever are traveling so because this repeater is pointed this way information is traveling in this direction so this is the first model uh, of a computer and this is probably the most basic model that you can have of any uh, computer in general you have this black part which is some kind of memory in this case I'm calling it RAM so th this is my memory it stores information I can send information here and I can save it to this black part this RAM and I can load information and bring it to this yellow part and this yellow part is an ALU now if you don't know what an ALU is, an ALU stands for arithmetic logic unit and basically it's the part of the computer that does all the math so it, it's kinda like the brain, it, it can add, it can subtract it can in some cases multiply, divide, depends on what kind of ALU you have um, but it's just some kind of thing that modifies the data and processes it and produces an output so data comes from the RAM gets loaded down this wire the the green it signifies uh, where data uh, in the computer is flowing so a little bit of lag this green is the data coming from the RAM traveling to the ALU getting computed and sending back to RAM very very basic and that's kinda of the most basic model of a computer so moving on to the next model here we introduce different components that you can save data to so again we have our RAM and we have our data bus um, and a, a bus is just a, a series of uh, wires that or um, like a, an inf information highway uh, a wire or series of wires that information can flow through and uh, in this case gets sent to different parts so th this is a bus and so my information can either go to the ALU it can go to this this is just a display uh, a model of a display or it can get sent here and this is I guess you could say some sort of output uh, let's call it a, a binary display or something like that so information is stored in RAM and sent to this main bus now in a computer uh, what's gonna happen is if you're not controlling where you want this information to go it's just gonna get sent to the ALU sent to the display and sent to the to this display but you don't want it to get sent to all different places at once what if you only want to send this data to the ALU or what if you only want to send this data to the display well that's what these blue parts are and these blue parts are what we call uh, in a computer a register and basically what it does is when you want this data in the bus can get saved to this blue part and when that data is saved it gets sent that this new saved data gets sent to whatever component we want so let's say we read uh, a number five and we send this number five into the main bus and we want to send that number five to the ALU so what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to what's called clock this register and that means that when we clock it when we input a a pulse that information is going to get saved here but it's not going to get saved to the other places because the, the information can't go in and if you don't know what uh, the main component of a register is it's actually a what's called a D flip-flop and uh, over here is is kind of an example of a D flip-flop just so I can show you uh, how it works if you're a little confused so as you can see we have an output 
this here is our clock. So when this pulses, our data is going to get saved to our output. So th and, and this is our data input. So if we input data here, nothing's going to happen because we're not saving it. Um, and so you can imagine data is being sent to this main bus and it's getting output, let's say, to the display. But now, let's say this is for the ALU. We want to send this data to the ALU. So let's say we want to uh, send the number 1 to the ALU. So this is going to turn on and we're going to clock this, this, uh, this clock here and as you can see the data gets sent to the ALU and now no matter what we do we can change this all we want we're sending data to the display to the binary display and nothing's gonna change until we wanna save a zero into the ALU so we're gonna clock it again and th the output changes now it's a zero so that's basically how it works except instead of only having it for one uh, one wire or one bit we're gonna have it for all bits th uh, of the computer all, all the data we wanna send it to so each wire is going to have one of these attached to it and all the clocks are going to be um, attached to one main line so when you clock it, it clocks all of them and that's kind of how these registers work so moving on to the next model we have our RAM, our ALU, our displays and we have our, our registers here but if we were to say load something from RAM and save it to the ALU what's going to prevent that data from just being sent to RAM? What if we want to output from somewhere else? Let's say this random number generator or this here which is a user input. What if we want to output some random number and save, save it to RAM? Well, the, the data that's saved in the ALU is going to be going through and saving to RAM and it's going to be interfering with this, oh, a little bit of lag, with this random number generator. So these light blue parts are what's called a buffer or a save register I guess you could say and basically um, let's say we save a number to this register and this ALU is outputting something this light blue part is going to stop information from flowing into this main bus and the way it does that is it, it, it's just going to uh, prevent the data from going through and I'll, I'll show you an example of this uh, back here so as you can see, this is basically an AND gate. So information can be sent through. This is, imagine the information being sent out of the ALU, but it's not affecting this output until we want it to. So now we want this information to get sent to the output, so we're going to turn this one on, and oh look, the information sent, and whatever we change is going to change in the output until we turn it off again, and now nothing is going to be affected. And this is just an AND gate. In this case, I have a, I have a piston AND gate, so you can see you know when the piston goes information goes um, when the piston isn't is retracted information can't flow very basic uh, a bit very basic buffer and so with that concept we can control from which output we want to send data to the RAM so if we turn this one on now we're gonna send data from the user input to the RAM or if we turn this one on we're gonna send a random number generator information or this one from the ALU um, and so that's another uh, model of the computer. But how do you control all of these? Right now we just have these buffers, but how do we know, how does the computer know when it needs to turn one of these on? Well that's when we introduce program memory. So this is the same model as before, but now we have this magenta block or this purple block. And this is kind of, this is our program memory. So the user or somebody uh, will program the computer um, using machine code so ones and zeros you input ones and zeros and zeros and ones and based off of those those ones and zeros we're gonna send the computer information so this here for instance you if we follow the line we will send information to the ALU now this this line here is the ALU function select so based on what input we're sending through here we're gonna tell the ALU to do something maybe add or maybe subtract or multiply or uh, and or XOR or whatever we want it to do doesn't matter um, we're gonna send through this line this line is for our buffers which lo which location we want to load data from and save to the RAM that's what this is for <coughs> this here 
connects to the RAM, and this will tell the RAM what line of, of uh, data we want to load or what line of data we want to save to. So the RAM has many, many different lines of, of uh, data, uh, or addresses is what, is what it's called. And the ad each address has basically a binary value. So let's say z this is address 0, address 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on and so forth. And so if you know your computer has, let's say, 1 gigabyte of RAM, that means it has 1 gigabyte uh, of different address places, or a, pro a little bit uh, more than 1 million different locations where you can save data. Um, <clears throat> and each data location has 8 bits, which is the equivalent of 1 byte. Um, and so this just selects which location we want to load from or which location we want to save to. And finally we have this one which selects uh, which register we want to save to. So basically our program memory uh, will send data to the computer, to all these different parts of the computer, and it will tell the computer what to do. <coughs> Sorry, my throat's a little bit dry. should have a glass of water, but I don't. <laughs> okay. So that's that's the program memory. Now we're going to talk about decoders. Now if you don't know what a decoder is, I'm going to quickly do an explanation because decoders are probably one of the most important things in uh, any computer and in most redstone creations, to be honest. So this is an example of a 2-bit decoder. Now in binary, um, 2 bits can represent four different numbers. We can have 0, 0, we can have 0, 1, we can have 1, 0, or 1, 1. And if you look here, these are four different outputs. So these outputs will signify what different state these two inputs are in. So if we have 0, 0, in binary this is 0, our 0 bit is going to, or our 0 output is going to be on. If we have 0, 1, which is 1 in binary, our 1 is going to be on. 1, 0 is 2, and 1, 1 is 3. And so basically, it will give us a decimal output from a binary input. So if we look over here, our ALU function is going to be affected by these decoders because we're just sending information to the ALU. But if we look at our um, where we want to read from our buffers, we're going to be inputting a binary number. Let's say this number is 2-bit as before, because we only have three, uh, three inputs here, so we can select all three of these using only two bits. So let's say we have the, bin the, the program uh, memory is sending this decoder the number 1-1. One, one. Uh, actually, no, let's say 0-1. Now that number is going to be decoded here, and one of these three is going to then turn on, but only one of these three, because we don't want to get in, in, in any interference, as said before. So let's say 0, 1 will turn the uh, user input on and send data from the user input. Let's say 1, 0 will send data from the random number generator, and let's say 1, 1 will send data from the ALU. And so basically, we're taking this binary uh, value, which is inputted in the program memory, and the computer will select, based on that, where we want to load from. And the same thing happens here with the RAM. So this here um, will send a binary number to this decoder, and as a result, it will tell us what line we want to load from, what, what uh, part of the RAM we want to load from. And the same here for where we want to save to. So we, we kind of split it up. Here we want to, here's where we load from, here's where we save to and we're inputting binary values and they're both going to decoders uh, here and here this pink this, if you if you haven't already guessed sorry this pink part is the is the decoder um, <clears throat> and that decoder is giving us an output um, which is going to be sent to the RAM and then the RAM is going to give us uh, what line we've selected and then the same thing uh, as said before as the buffers happen to the registers so we send a binary value to this decoder and that will send data to all of these different registers and select which one of these registers we want to save. So the RAM will be outputting to this main bus and then based on this this input here one of these three will be selected to uh, have the data save in. Um, and finally um, 
this this here this this line here is kind of the concept of go to so if you haven't watched uh, my previous videos where I, I kind of talked about go to briefly um, basically what go to does is it it's how you select in a computer what line of code you want to go to um, so you have a decoder here and this decoder um, is connected to the program memory and based on the binary input that you send to the decoder it'll select one of the lines of program memory um, and so the easiest way to do this is or in my opinion is a go-to system so each line of program memory has a designated set of, of binary bits that tells the computer what line of code that you want to go to next. What line of code do you want to execute in the next uh, in the next clock cycle? So let's say this this number is is four bits. So you have 16 lines of program memory. Uh, and let's say you want to go to uh, 1110. So that's uh, 14. So that data is going to be sent here to this decoder. This decoder is going to decode it and output line 14. Then line 14, let's say, is going to have line 15. That line 15 is going to go through here and to the decoder and output line 15, and so on and so forth. And that'll keep happening until, let's say, uh, 0, 0, 0 is selected, and then it'll go to line 0. But maybe the computer doesn't have a line 0, and so therefore it'll just shut down and shut off. Uh, so that's basically how uh, a go-to system uh, works. Um, but obviously one of the problems with that, if you haven't already guessed, or one of the problems with this particular model, is that information is going to be sent to the decoder, output a new line, and then immediately get sent back. And it's going to keep kind of going in this endless loop, back and forth, until it stops. But we want to have this all controlled. so. In our next slide, we have a clock. Now, a clock is probably the most important part of a computer. What the clock does is it basically synchronizes all of the events in the computer. So without a clock, all of these, like the, the loading from RAM and the saving to the registers, that's all going to happen, let's say, at the same time or at random times. But in a computer, you can't have that. You have to tell every single part of the computer when to execute. Let's say it takes, um, in Minecraft, let's say it takes 10 ticks for the data to go from the RAM to these registers. Well, that means that the clock should wait 10 ticks before loading from RAM and before saving to the registers. That way, um, it all kind of happens in, in a sequence. There is no random events. It's just 10 ticks later, this happens. So we're going to save, uh, we're going to clock it 10 ticks later, then 10, t then 10 ticks later the information goes through the ALU, so at that point we're going to un we're gonna, um, open this buffer and send the data ba back to RAM and so on and so forth. And at the same time, just kind of talking about before, we're going to have uh, a D flip-flop or some kind of a register here in the GoTo system. So the, the line of code will get sent to the decoder, it'll get outputted to this the program memory, the next line of code, a little bit of lag, sorry. Next line of code, 14, uh, 1110, will get sent and it will wait here. And it will wait until the clock pulses. And when the clock pulses, this next line of code, this 14, is going to get saved, outputted, and then 15 is going to get sent. And it's going to wait here and wait and wait and wait until the computer's finished executing. And then the clock tick is going to go again. And this process just keeps repeating over and over and over again. And so um, now I'm just going to show you uh, generally where uh, a clock needs to go into a computer. So as, as you can see, this clock is going to send an output to this register at a certain time. That new line of code is going to get sent to the program memory, and it's going to take a certain time for that to get sent to this decoder through the decoder and to the program memory. And that amount of time is kind of the delay between this clock tick and when the data is outputted from the program memory. <clears throat> so based on when this this uh, next line happens, when the clock pulses this next line, we can tell how many clock, uh, how, how long after this happens we're getting an output from our program memory. So that output is going to get 
sent, let's say, to the ALU, and that's going to have a certain delay, and we're going to delay that um, so that when the next, when the new data comes into the ALU, uh, that's when the function comes in, and so on. And basically, based on when this information goes out, we're going to delay how long it takes for that that new line of code to get to these different places, based on when information is flowing through the computer. Um, so, like using the last example, it takes 10 ticks from the uh, RAM uh, to read and get sent to these different places. So it's going to take um, 10 ticks from the time that we output here and load the RAM till the time that these need to clock. Uh, so you can see this this red part not only runs to the uh, the program counter but it also runs to uh, this buffer here which controls uh, when we save information so um, we're, we actually have a, del a, sorry, a delay on this line um, so that we know exactly when the RAM is going to save because it may take let's say 30 ticks for the RAM to go from the RAM to the ALU through the ALU and back to RAM so we need to load the information uh, 30 ticks before we save the information. So, rather than saving at any random time, this clock controls using this buffer. Um, so the only the information only goes through when the clock pulses when we when we need it to. So th this is this is uh, set to the right delay. <clears throat> and in in the same way, um, this in, this clock is going to control when we save to the registers. So we're going to load the information 10 ticks before this buffer is going to open up and save the information to these different locations because it takes 10 ticks for this RAM to output to these different locations. And finally, this, this is just kind of an extra. Um, this clock tick uh, or this, this line tells this, this display when to draw. So um, based on when we get information here, as we from the example, we know it takes 10 ticks for this, t uh, 10 ticks after this, for the register to to send new data. So maybe it takes 12 ticks for this this uh, clock tick here to output, um, because we need a little bit of time for this data to go to the display. I don't know. Uh, either way, that's how a clock works. It times all of the different parts of the computer so that nothing happens at random. It's all synchronized. Everything everything has a um, kind of happens uh, sequentially and at the right time. Uh, and just to, to kind of demonstrate a clock, uh, I, I have a little example. So we, we pulse the input and you can see the clock goes around and we can, we can modify how long it takes for the clock to go around. This is called the, the period of the clock. Um, so let's say in this case we have uh, 4 plus 4 uh, plus 4 plus 4 plus 4, which is 20. So this is a 20 tick uh, clock. Uh, so every every 20 ticks or two seconds, this output will clock. Um, and then when we want to turn the computer off, we just turn this this clock off and it resets back to normal. And now the computer's off. <coughs> uh, so yeah, moving on to the next part. Now is where we start to get a little bit more complicated. Um, this is where we introduce uh, what I've kind of referred to before as conditional go-to or just condition conditions in general. So let's bring up the following example. Um, let's say we want the computer to wait in a loop. We want it to continue going to line 4 until uh, the user presses a button. When the user presses a button we want the computer to say, oh, the user has pressed a button, he's ready for me to continue, and I'm going to now go to line 5. So instead of line 4 being sent, we're now going to send line 5, and then line 5 goes to line 6, and 7, and 8, and the computer keeps running. So we want the computer to wait for something to happen. Or, or let's say um, we send it data to the ALU. And the ALU will tell us whether whether uh, number A or B is greater than than let's say or let's say whether uh, A is equal to B, and we want to, the computer to go to um, line seven if the, it is equal and line eight if it's not equal. 
So this turquoise uh, line uh, gets fed information from different parts of the computer. And th that information is in the form of uh, single bits. And so let's say we have uh, this here. This is coming from the user input. So let's say we have a button that the user inputs, and when that button is pressed, we get uh, that bit is turned on down this line and gets sent to, uh, to this decoder here. And I'll talk to you more about what this decoder does in a second. Uh, or we have information from the ALU. So as I said before, greater than, less than, equal, or overflow, underflow, it's just di different parts of the ALU. Or uh, here we have the random number generator. So we could have, uh, we could say, um, go to uh, what, uh, continue the program if the random number generator is on, or stop the program if it's off because it needs to be on, or wait until it turns on, or something, something along those lines. So those, all those different conditions um, are sent to this uh, this part here. And what this part here does is we, we send information from the program memory as to what condition we want to look at. So let's say in the program I want to see if when A is greater than B I want to go somewhere. So we're going to send an address to this decoder of uh, that, that is basically the A equals B output. So let's say that is uh, 1111. When we input the binary number 111, or sorry, the, the binary number 111, um, then that means we want to check if A is equal to B. So that three bit number is going to get sent to this decoder, <clears throat> and um, it's going to check, it's going to compare that, that um, result with the result from this ALU. So the ALU is going to send that data, and it's going to compare the two. And if both that A equals B and the, the check, the, the, the fact that we want to access A equals B, if both of them are correct, then we're going to send the value of uh, true to the um, line selector. And I'll talk to you about that in a sec. Um, but if, let's say, we want to check if A equals B, but A does not equal B, then, then when we and the two together, they will not, um, they will not equal one, and we're going to send a, a, a false value to this line selector. So this here kind of looks very convoluted. I tried to display it as best as I, as I could with the kind of system that I had, where this is the condition, this is the buffer, this is the decoder. But I have an example back here. Uh, and that's just to kind of make it easier, because I, I know how confusing it can be. So <clears throat> when we have binary number 00, zero we're not looking for anything. We don't want to check if there's a condition. We're just going to forget about it. But let's say we want to check if the condition 1 is on. So we're going to send a, a binary number 1. This is from the program memory to this to this decoder. And it's going to output. But it's going to be checking here. It's going to check if this condition is on. So because this condition is off, my output is off. But if I were to turn this condition on, my output turns on. and you know, if let's say th this is A equals B, if A does equal B and I'm checking, uh, I'm looking for A to equal B, then my output will be on. But if I'm not looking for A to equal to B, then I'm not checking here anymore and this is off. Or if A does not equal B, well, I'm checking here, but A does not equal B, therefore I'm going to be off. So let's say I'm checking a different one. Let's say I'm checking if the user input is on. Then I'm going to be checking the number in value 2. So if, if the button is on, then the output's on, or if the button's off, the output's off. And because I'm looking here, any input on any of the other parts is un it unaffects this condition. It does not affect this until I'm looking for it. And just like the first two, if we're looking for three, then this will not affect it, this will not affect it, but this, the third condition, will affect it. So based on what the program memory is looking for, and what the actual result is. So here's, here's the result that we're looking for, and that's the result. Here are results, but we're not looking for them, therefore we're not getting an output. Um, we will get a condition. So that's what's happening here. Uh, and that, that condition is being sent to this, which is um, called a multiplexer. And uh, don't be afraid. I'm, I'm going to explain to you what a multiplexer does. Um, 
based on this condition, whether or not it's, so if this is on or if this is off, we're going to select which value we want to load from. So let's say this, this here, we're going to give an input of what line of code we want to go to if the condition is false. And let's say we'll input here what line of code to go to if the condition is true. And based off of this condition here, we're going to select which one we want to output. So if this is off, we're going to output this one. And if this is on, we're going to output this one. And the output gets sent here to this register and to the line of code. And this multiplexer, uh, here, here's an example of it. So if we look, this piston is kind of controlling which line we want to output to the, to the output. So in, in, when this is off, the condition's false. We're going to send this line and this will remain unaffected, but when this is on, this will remain unaffected and this will affect it. And that's basically how a multiplexer works. Um, and so now we're checking for the condition, we're outputting conditions, and based on our condition, we are going to a specific line of code. And that's basically what conditional go to is. So based on this condition, and we're, we're deciding which condition we want to look at, we're going to go to either this line of code or this line of code. So now, going back to our previous example, let's say we want to go to 0, 1, 0, 0, which is 4. We're going to go to 4 if the condition is false, and we're going to wait and wait and wait, and it's going to keep repeating 4 until, um, and, and we're going to be looking for, let's say, user input 1, 0, 0, 1. Uh, we're looking for user input 1, so until this user input turns on, no output will be going through here, and therefore we're not going to be looking for, we're not going to be going to 5, we're going to be going to 4. But when that condition turns on, then this line will turn on because we're looking for it, and we'll be going to this other one. We'll be going to the other go-to condition and outputting that to the program memory. I'm sorry if that's really confusing and really complicated, um, but it is quite a difficult concept to understand. Uh, I do recommend that you download this file. Um, I, I'm going to be including this and kind of check all this out because this here, th this idea of conditional go to is probably the most complicated idea in uh, a computer. But if you think about it, it's kind of the most important because the computer needs to be able to do some kind of logic. And this is basically a, um, a form of computer logic. Um, so finally, this is the last one. <clears throat> I just basically included a few extra features in this one. So if you haven't seen already, um, my computer Bluestone um, has a few uh, interesting features, such as indicator lights, or um, uh, it has a, a program line um, it has a display to show which program line it's on, or it has uh, uh, Boolean, uh, f uh, Boolean uh, logic or conditions, uh, also known as flags. So I just kind of included those in here. Um, so the program memory will tell this uh, iron block kind of represents uh, a little bit of memory. So this program memory can um, can turn flags on or off, and those are just conditions, kind of true or false uh, values uh, that can be used by the program memory. <clears throat> I also have indicator lights, so I can turn indicators on, and uh, I'll put those to the user input, and that's just this, uh, this iron block again, just temporary memory. And lastly, uh, this just kind of outputs to the program memory to show what line of code you're on. So just basic stuff, but, you know, I, I decided to throw them in. Um, just so you can kind of relate it to uh, to the computer that I made a little bit more, just to kind of show you guys how those those functions work. So yeah, that is how a computer works, um, and how most redstone computers work in Minecraft. Uh, this isn't how all redstone computers work. There are different chunks aren't loading. Uh, there are different variations. There are computers with multiple cores, um, stuff like that. But uh, a basic redstone computer will fall under one of these categories. 
Um, starting from the most basic, just RAM and an ALU, and kind of moving on to the more advanced, uh, which is more along the lines of, of what Bluestone, um, the Redstone computer that I made, uh, is. So as I said before, I'm going to be providing a download link in the description for this world file so you guys can check it out yourself. Uh, I hope this helps uh, in your understanding of how uh, these redstone computers work. I know that uh, that it's really confusing. Uh, I went through that stage. Uh, it, it is very confusing. But um, if you didn't get it, try re-watching re this video um, and hopefully it helps. Uh, so yeah, thank you for watching guys and I will see you guys all later. Thanks. Bye.